It's October once more, and that means it's time for another creepy Halloween horror-themed video. This year, we're actually diving into a bit of American folklore, which for the better part of 200 years, and possibly a bit longer, has haunted and scared readers, viewers, and townsfolk alike. This comes in the form of the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow, perhaps one of the most historically intertwined ghouls to plague the United States, as his origins are nearly as old as the country itself, with elements rooted deep within the Revolutionary War. Now, chances are good you've heard of the Headless Horseman, or at least a version of it. The idea of a headless entity atop a horse, with or without its head in hand, has been around for hundreds of years, and as such has evolved into urban legends and mythical tales embedded and told in many cultures throughout parts of the world mainly Europe. Such countries include, but are not limited to, Germany and parts of Northern Europe with tales of headless riders and hunters collected and made popular by the Brothers Grimm, with some simply being bearers of danger giving warning, while others are bringers of torment and death. Scotland with a warrior who had ambitions of being a clan chieftain, but was killed during a battle near Dwart Castle on the island of Mull, and is now cursed to roam the battlefields riding his horse, which too is headless. Ireland with its Dullahan, sometimes called Gankian, meaning without a head, considered a sort of hobgoblin or evil spirit which is said to cause someone's death by simply stopping its ride or calling out one's name. England with its Arthurian tale Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which sees the Green Knight decapitated by Sir Gawain after issuing a challenge. Rather than dying, the knight simply picks up his head and rides off holding it, only for Sir Gawain to have to seek him out one years hence. There's even a more recent urban legend from Japan that originated in the 1970s that sees a headless motorcycle rider who was decapitated and continues to drive on searching for his head and those responsible. Now, these were just a few, but they help paint a picture that the concept of a headless rider who is often a malevolent, or at least cautionary being, has become intertwined in many cultures and countries, and so naturally it was only a matter of time until something like it would wind up in the United States. This finally came in 1820 with the publishing of Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. In it, it tells the tale of Ichabod Crane, a schoolmaster who has recently begun residing in the hamlet of Sleepy Hollow, which, according to its residents, is rife with tales, superstition, spirits, and the supernatural. At odds with the local favorite, Abraham Brom Bones Van Brunt, due to both of them trying to woo over Katrina Van Tassel, the only daughter of the rich Van Tassel family, Ichabod, one night after attending an evening of merriment and ghost stories, tries to win her over, but fails. Now, after dark, he must return to his lodging on his horse Gunpowder, but along the way is taken upon by a dark, cloaked, and silent figure, who soon reveals to not have a head upon his shoulders, but down on his saddle. After a hasty chase, the horseman throws his head at Ichabod, not knocking him to the ground and down an embankment, after which he is never seen nor heard from again by the locals. Now, this was just a brief overview of the tale, but there's certainly more to it than that, and is definitely worth a read if you haven't done so already. But with the original tale being released in 1820, it has been published, told, depicted, adapted, and altered many ways over the last two plus centuries, which also includes the spectral rider terrorizing the area in and around Sleepy Hollow through varying illustrations, paintings, cartoons, movies, TV shows, and video games, all of which portray him differently. But it can be said that pretty much all of these depictions are inaccurate, in a way. Obviously, these can be chalked up to artistic license and their creators trying to give the writer a far more sinister look and feel, as Irving didn't go into too much detail describing the writer simply as a galloping Hessian of the hollow, who was a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame, being gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak. However, this claim can be backed up by a few things, so let's dive into some history here that surrounds not only Irving, but also Sleepy Hollow, and put together the pieces of what the Headless Horseman would more than likely look like. To do this, we must first venture back to the American Revolution. Breaking out in 1775, but really expanding in scope the following year, some of the largest action occurred in and around New York City. Come August of 1776, the British, which up until then had more or less been on the back heel thanks to colonials capturing forts in northern New York as well as Boston, landed troops on Staten Island and eventually invaded Long Island, with the final goal of capturing the strategically important Port of New York. Trying to stop this, General Washington's army met General Howe in Brooklyn where one of the largest battles of the war took place, which led to the Continental Army retreating to Manhattan and eventually eluding pursuing British forces. The armies would meet again at the end of October at the Battle of White Plains, roughly 30 miles, or 48 kilometers north, 
and only around 8 miles, or about 13 kilometers east of Sleepy Hollow. Again, Washington would be defeated and the Americans would retreat up north, this time digging in around Peekskill, about 30 miles away. For the remainder of the war, these lines would more or less stay the same, resulting in much of the area in between, specific distances are somewhat disputed depending on source, now known as Westchester County, becoming a neutral ground, though it was anything but, as it was more akin to a no-man's land. Dr. James Thatcher, a chronicler of the war, described it as such. The country is rich and fertile, but it now has the marks of a country in ruins. A large proportion of the proprietors have abandoned their farms. The few that remain find it impossible to harvest their produce. Banditi, consisting of lawless villains, devote themselves to the most cruel pillage and robbery among the defenseless inhabitants between the lines. These shameless marauders have received the names of cowboys and skinners. By their atrocious deeds, they have become a scourge and terror to the people. Even Irving himself described it as, the British and American lines had run near it during the war. It had, therefore, been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees, cowboys, and all kinds of border chivalry. On top of this, forces from both sides would also frequently traverse and scout the area. It was even the site where Major John Andre was captured, leading to the discovery of Benedict Arnold's betrayal. So you may be wondering, where does the horseman come into play with all of this? Well, throughout the war, this no man's land saw various forces ranging from British regulars, loyalists, continentals, militiamen, and and irregulars, and most significant for this story, Hessians. Throughout the war, the British enlisted, or rather bought, the help of roughly 30,000 German fighters. Not technically mercenaries, these forces, primarily from the German states of Hesse Kassel and Hesse Hanau, then territories of the Holy Roman Empire, technically remained in the service of their governments, but were essentially rented by the British and helped fill in the gaps when it came to land forces. Of these 30,000, many distinct units were seen, each of which had their own unique uniforms that helped both friend and foe identify them. Of these, the most prominently seen units throughout the neutral zone was the Jaeger Corps. Known as Hunter Corps in English, these troops, clad in forest green uniforms with scarlet red facings, stood above the rest of German forces, as they were renowned for their sharpshooting, scouting, hunting, and general outdoorsmanship, making them elite soldiers that were granted a bit more privilege. Oh, and many of them were considered skilled riders. Seen primarily throughout New York and Pennsylvania, these Jaegers were frequently included in Loyalist and British-backed raids into the zone, taking on any suspected Patriot supporters or strongholds. One such raiding party, led by British forces, and depending on source, Tories, those being Loyalists, and Hessians ventured into the zone on a cold November night in 1777. It was here they set the Van Tassel home ablaze and arrested the men who had connections to the local Patriot militia. And yes, they share the same name as the family featured in the story. However, in the confusion, their two-year-old daughter, Leah, was lost with her mother, Elizabeth, terrified she was still in the home. At that point, a Hessian soldier led her over to the child, safely wrapped in a blanket nearby. Once reunited, the two went into hiding. Now, supposedly in the spring of 1778, the headless body of a Hessian, with some retelling specifically saying a Jaeger, was discovered on a nearby road. Elizabeth, still grateful of the Hessian who saved her child, had her family pay for the burial in the old Dutch cemetery in Sleepy Hollow. How that soldier died and when has more or less been lost to time though two interesting elements from the nearby Battle of White Plains may have helped add to this story. Fought at the end of October 1777, the Battle of White Plains is considered a pivotal engagement of the early years of the war, as its outcome solidified British control over New York City and most of southern New York, as Washington and his army had to retreat into New Jersey and eventually Pennsylvania. Now, some attribute this engagement as the inspiration for the story's line, some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War, even though it is very much remembered. However, there were a few skirmishes that aren't as well known. During the rough time frame of the battle, that being October 27th to the 31st, two interesting instances were recorded, both by American Major General William Heath in his memoirs. The first tells of a group of British and Hessian cavalry which had American artillery fire at them. The right column composed of British troops, preceded by about 20 light horse, leapt the fence of a wheat field at the foot of the hill on which Colonel Malcolm's regiment was posted, of which the light horse were not aware, until a shot from Lieutenant Fenno's field piece gave them notice, by striking in the midst of them and a horseman pitching from his horse. The second, from a different engagement, was a bit more specific and detailed. A shot from the American cannon at this place took off the head of a Hessian artilleryman. They also left one of the artillery horses dead on the field. Now, considering Hessian Jaeger companies were used quite extensively during the battle, 
with Hessians in general often leading assaults, it's a good possibility one or both of these instances saw Jaegers killed and thus in a way contributed to the story in some way, shape, or form. So all this info regarding the war, its battles, skirmishes, forces, and events that surrounded the village and this no man's land help paint the picture rather well. But how exactly do they all fit into the legend of Sleepy Hollow? Well, to start, Irving, who himself was interested in legends and the supernatural, had based elements of his story on things, places, and people he interacted with, as many writers often do. Born and raised in nearby Manhattan, he was sent north to Terrytown to stay with family friends during an outbreak of yellow fever in 1798. It was during this time he first became familiar with the area, its inhabitants, and a lot of the local legends and tales. From there, he would make frequent trips to the area for many years after, eventually moving back a few decades later. Names like Van Tassel, which had been a family residing there long before the war, became familiar and as such ended up in the story too. He even bought a home built by the family in 1832, which would become the historic Sunnyside. As for the tale of the horseman, many point to two possible sources of influence. The first being his friend Walter Scott, of whom he met while traveling in Europe. Scott too was interested in folk tales and legends, translating many Germanic tales such as the Wild Huntsman and others that also involved spectral, and sometimes headless, horsemen. He also encouraged Irving to continue writing and no doubt ideas and tales were shared between the two. The second is a bit more close to the source, as supposedly an actual tale of a headless horseman had circulated for a time after the war around the Terrytown area. The original story involves a Dutchman who had a close call after seeing the spirit of a headless Hessian materialize from the old Dutch burying grounds on his way home from a night of drinking. But either way, you get the idea as to how all of these historical elements, experiences, and encounters, be they directly or told secondhand, thirdhand, and so on, made their way to Irving and were ultimately woven into the legend. So, that all being said, let's wrap this video up with the breakdown of a mounted Hessian Jaeger's uniform, which seems to be the most likely garment the horseman would have been wearing while hunting down Ichabod Crane and any of his other potential victims. And as a quick note, due to a mix of non-standardized accoutrements and overall age, a few pieces showcased are general representations rather than specific exact ones. Though there were various Jaeger units throughout the war operating in different theaters, for the most part they wore the same uniform. As mentioned before, their coats were forest green with scarlet red facings that included yellow buttons. Waistcoats were often the same green with their breeches either matching or white in color. Underneath this would have been a white shirt with a black neck stock, a sort of precursor to the modern day tie wrapped around the collar. When he had a head, he likely would have been wearing a brown or black tricorn hat with a matching green cockade and or feather plume. As a rider, he would have sported some form of leather gauntlet gloves, which were frequently white, along with knee-high black leather jack boots, possibly with spurs, as opposed to shoes accompanied by gaiters of various lengths, which were usually the same forest green, brown, black, or white in color that were worn by Jaegers serving on foot. Firearms-wise, Jaegers didn't really use muskets but rather rifles, which often didn't have bayonet mounts, meaning forces would usually be seen with a Hirschfanger or deer catcher, a sort of short sword or long dagger. Being that they were issued, gifted, or bought, the styles would have varied. However, him being on horseback would have likely changed two things. Using a rifle would be challenging, so a flintlock pistol or two may have also been carried, as they were easier to fire. Second, though not as common as the Hirschfanger, many mounted units also utilized curved cavalry-style swords. Whether or not they were carried really came down to the objective of riders, as they were utilized more for scouting, patrolling, or getting from point to point quickly, rather than for cavalry attack. As far as equipment, he'd have the standard, but not standardized accessories soldiers would have had during that time, such as a waist belt, haversack, canteen, powder horn, and cartridge box that was either mounted on the belt or slung around the shoulder. Finally, as far as any sort of cloak or cape, riders would often throw some additional piece over themselves depending on the elements and overall temperature. However, during battles and skirmishes, such a thing may get in the way or caught up in equipment or branches, so he may or may not have utilized one. So here it is, the complete uniform the Headless Horseman of Sleepy Hollow would likely have had on, with all the accompanying dirt, grime, stains, aging, and all aptly displayed on a headless mannequin. Whether we'll actually see this uniform worn by the horseman in some future iteration of the tale, be it on the big screen, television, or through some other medium is hard to say, but hopefully now those curious have a better idea of the historically accurate look. But that will more or less bring us to the end of this video. It was certainly a fun one to put together as it incorporated a little bit of everything seen on this channel. History, costuming, on-location filming, and uniform highlights, all wrapped up in a nice horror theme. And if you're not a fan of the season or the horseman, it's a quick breakdown of uniforms of the Jaeger Corps. Anyway though, if you ever get a chance to visit Sleepy Hollow, do so, as not only does it play into the legend, but as the story states, 
a drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. This is especially the case come the month of October, and even if you don't go during the Halloween season, it and the surrounding area has quite a bit to offer from a historical perspective with many significant spots tying back to the American Revolution. But as always, if you enjoyed the video and found it entertaining, consider leaving a like and subscribing if you haven't already done so. If not, no vexations upon yourself. just be sure to have a good Halloween season, check back soon for more videos right here on Uniform History, and be sure to cross the old bridge before the horseman gets you.